thank you all for being here today for today's hearing with the Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works Subcommittee on Fisheries, Water, and Wildlife. This hearing will examine one of the most pressing issues for communities in Illinois and throughout the nation, water infrastructure. Last year, the Senate passed the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which included the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act, also known as DOEA, sexy name. A bill that Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, Senator Lummis, and myself worked on to make a reality. The WIA provides historic investments and programmatic changes to help states, communities, and schools fix and upgrade aging water systems to improve water quality while fostering economic growth and jobs throughout the country. In fact, the WIA is the most significant federal investment in water infrastructure in history, and I am thrilled to see that President Biden's budget request for the full federal funding of all the WIA programs. While this bill is an incredible first step towards clean water for all, our jobs are not done. Now we must do the work to ensure that these programmatic changes are carried out and these critical funds get to the communities that need it the most. There has been a historic lack of investment in water infrastructure, but especially so for disadvantaged small rural and tribal communities that each have individual challenges when it comes to water infrastructure. Our lack of attention to these communities is not acceptable. We must break down barriers for funding to ensure every American has access to clean water, no matter their zip code, the color of their skin, or the size of their wallet. The WIA's goal is to help do just that. The bill reauthorizes and enhances the state revolving funds, or the SRFs, which are the most efficient tools we have to provide states with federal investments that empower local leaders to modernize water systems implement lead reduction projects, and rebuild storm, storm water overflow. By lowering non-federal cost shares, increasing the use of grants, and allowing for debt forgiveness, we will help communities access federal dollars that typically struggle to qualify for traditional loans. Years of lack of investment and oversight have led towns all across America to slide into disrepair. We have worked within our states to give these communities a chance at a normal life and funding opportunities like the programs in DeWea could provide this chance. The bill also works to get shovels into the ground and support quality jobs by reauthorizing and streamlining financing programs like WIFIA and SRFs. However, with significant funding comes significant responsibility. The states will have to prepare for these programmatic changes and federal dollars and that is no small feat. One of the significant water infrastructure projects that the states will have to plan for is the national health crisis of lead pipes. As the senator with the most known lead service lines of any state, and with lead poisoning disproportionately impacting communities of color and low-income communities, this cause is very near to my heart. The bipartisan infrastructure law provides over $15 billion for President Biden's National Comprehensive Lead Service Line Replacement Initiative, and DeWea provides an additional authorizations for more than $700 million for lead reduction programs, like my Voluntary Lead Testing and Removal in Schools and Child Care Facilities program. Yes, this National Lead Removal Initiative will be a lot of work, but it will be worth it to protect our future generations. With the EPA's recent SRF implementation guidance, I am excited to see that they are following through on Congress's intent to make disadvantaged small rural and tribal communities the priority of this water infrastructure funding, and we will continue our oversight to ensure that the states deliver on this vision. Today, we have an excellent lineup of witnesses to provide firsthand knowledge of how these programs work for their communities, any improvements needed, and how the changes that DeWea provided will help them in the future. From permanent brain damage to overflowing sewage to costly service interruptions, our constituents are now experiencing the harms that result from allowing our drinking water and wastewater systems to age into a state of disrepair. And now is the time to fix this in an efficient and equitable manner. <coughs> As subcommittee chair, I look forward to today's discussion on best practices to ensure the success of this committee's long-term goal of providing families in Illinois <coughs> and across our nation, clean, safe, reliable water. Thank you to Chairman Carper, Ranking Member Capito, and Subcommittee Ranking Member Lummis for making this a priority for the committee because it is absolutely a priority for me. 
I would now like to turn it over to subcommittee ranking member Lummis for her opening statement. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman. And it's so nice to spend time with you again, like we did in the House, and be back with you on this subcommittee. Um, and thanks also to our witnesses for being here. I very much look forward to your testimony and your answers to our questions. At the beginning of this Congress last year, I was honored to work with Senators Carper, Capito, Duckworth, and others to craft the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act. I'm proud that that product was bipartisan and created a responsible and measured investment in our nation's water infrastructure. That bill passed this committee unanimously and later the full Senate by a vote of 89 to 2. It was then signed into law as part of the Infrastructure and Jobs Act. Providing clean and reliable water in this country is clearly an issue that unites both sides. As important as it is for Congress to write and pass legislation, we also have the important job of then following up with oversight to ensure the executive branch fulfills its duty of faithfully executing the law. That's why we're here today. Going forward, we need to ensure the EPA follows both the letter and the spirit of the law as Congress intended. On March 8th of this year, the EPA issued implementation guidance for infrastructure bill funds appropriated to the state revolving funds. My comments and questions today will focus primarily on that memorandum. So a few key points. The state revolving funds under the Clean Water Act are a reflection of federalism. While Congress sets the eligible recipients projects in broad parameters, states were and are intended to be in the driver's seat. Over time, federal requirements have grown more and more expansive. Some call that creeping conditionalism. The March 8th memorandum worryingly appears to continue this trend. For one example, EPA's language around states' intended use plans is concerning, as neither the Clean Water Act nor the Safe Drinking Water Act give EPA authority over the development of state priority lists. The bottom line is that the EPA should not be substituting its own priorities, no matter how noble, over that of the states. Rural and disadvantaged communities experience different challenges than larger or more urban water systems. Lack of economies of scale, however uh, significant they may be, lower income levels and higher poverty rates all contribute to added challenges for these communities. In my state of Wyoming, 97% of the water systems are small serving populations of fewer than 10,000 people. Nationwide, that rate is 91%. Ensuring the EPA provides clear, defined program requirements well in advance will help these states and communities access Infrastructure Act funds as Congress intended. I believe it is the ultimate goal and shared goal to ensure communities that need the resources are the most prioritized public health and safety are enhanced, and that this is done in the most economical and cost-efficient manner. In closing, I'm proud of the work of the subcommittee. I'm proud of what it's done on a bipartisan basis, and I look forward to continuing our important oversight work on EPA and hopefully others within our jurisdiction as well. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Lummis. Now I would like to turn it over to our very special guest, Senator Booker, who has come today to introduce our first witness, the mayor of the city of Newark, New Jersey, the Honorable Ross Baraka. Thank you, Senator Booker, for coming to our subcommittee hearing today. Sit up. You may now introduce the witness. <laughs> <laughs> He's much shorter than I remember. <laughs> so uh, first and foremost, uh, I just want to thank the chairwoman for the invitation. And I want to thank uh, uh, the chairwoman and the ranking member for your extraordinary work in this area. You all have been the bipartisan Cagney and Lacey of, uh, and by the way, a lot of your young staffers are looking at me with a blank stare, like who's Cagney <laughs> and Lacey? 
Um, but you two have really uh, brought together uh, a, a bi in a bipartisan way, critically needed infrastructure, and your leadership is extraordinary. And I see, uh, uh, always to me, Chairman Inhofe, and just want to thank him for his friendship and partnership on many important things over the years. It's just good to see him here. This is a real pleasure for me. I, I've been looking forward to this moment all week where I get a chance to introduce somebody I've known uh, for more than two decades now. Uh, Raz Baraka is a special kind of leader. He is an activist and artist. He is one of the more respected leaders in our country when it comes to local leadership. And for a guy that lives still in the central ward of the city of Newark, he is my mayor. Uh, and his leadership uh, has been uh, exemplary in a lot of areas that, that it really should be noted, but of specific interest to this committee, uh, uh, the, the mayor has given a master's class and how to take on the crisis of lead in pipes. I mean, it is just extraordinarily how he is a standout. Uh, the head of the EPA uh, came to Newark uh, really in a, with a sense of awe about what the mayor uh, uh, completed under his leadership in partnership with others. And so, uh, as you're gonna hear in a lot of detail, uh, Newark's lead service line replacement program, one of the Newark's largest infrastructure projects to date, has successfully replaced over 23,000 lead service lines. The successful completion of this ambitious three-year project to replace thousands of lead service lines at no cost to residents is an example, not just a, a testimony really to the mayor's leadership, but it's an example of how local, state, and federal officials can come together, develop a comprehensive plan, and address a issue of serious environmental injustice and how they, through their work, have created a blueprint for communities working on similar infrastructure projects across the nation. With the past passage of our bipartisan infrastructure bill, more of these projects are going to be possible. And I believe uh, the wisdom uh, garnered uh, and demonstrated by Mayor Baraka is a great way for us to look to what the future could be. Uh, it's especially important, though, I want to call out the leadership of Essex County Executive uh, Joseph DiVincenzo. Uh, he's had a willingness to use the county's AAA bond rating to secure a $120 million bond that allowed the city to move extraordinarily quickly. Uh, during this time, a few years ago, uh, I was happy that my team was able to work with uh, a lot of the leadership of this committee and pass legislation that would allow states to access additional federal funds uh, so that more communities around the nation could upgrade their drinking water systems. I know that the city of Newark will be able to continue to lead the nation in modernizing their water infrastructure and with substantial and continued federal support like we're seeing. And the flexibility that you all wisely put into the bill uh, will really allow us to make sure the investments are made, that American jobs are created, and the infrastructure uh, is ultimately completed. We know that this is a national crisis that didn't come about last year or 10 years ago or 20 years ago. We have literally had millions of children being poisoned over decades in our country and have failed to step up to this national threat. As you indicated, Chairwoman, in your opening remarks, lead is a savage potential killer. It does permanent damage to kids' brains. And you and I, uh, Chair Wu, I'm sure, have had the experience of sitting with parents with their children's uh, um, uh, brains being addled by lead, knowing uh, that this severe violence has been done uh, to their children and uh, the urgencies that have been exposed as a result of our inaction. This is a great story for the Senate to act now. Uh, and uh, we now have one of the best of the best in America. Uh, for uh, talking about how we can do this. Because if there's anything that Raz Baraka has shown is that time is of the essence. There is a fierce urgency of the now. Money has been allocated, but my biggest concern now is the estimates in cities across this country, some of them upwards of 10 plus years to get those lead service lines replaced. That is unacceptable. We've got to find a way to learn from what Newark, New Jersey has done and expedite this so that our children are free from this toxic poison. Again, a real cheer and gratitude for the leadership of this committee on both sides of the aisle, and a lot of gratitude for you allowing me to come here and, and introduce someone who I know and love and really respect, Roz Baraka. Thank you, Senator Booker. 
high praise indeed. Now I will turn it over to Senator Inhoff, who will introduce our next witness, Susan Bodine. Not to be outdone <laughs> by Senator Booker. <laughs> Let me assure you that I've known the individual that I'm about, about to introduce uh, more than two decades now. <laughs> I'm, uh, in fact, I saw her in Oklahoma just last week, so uh, that's good. Susan uh, Bodine is, uh, served as the chief counsel on this committee when I was the chairman it was in 2015 and 2016. She helped us enact the uh, 2015 Highway Bill, the 2016 Water Resources Bill, the Frank Lautenberger uh, 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 Bill, Reform Bill, and 65 other bipartisan laws coming from this committee in only two years. Now, I don't think anyone else can outdo that. Uh, it's something that is on top of getting all this stuff done, it was enjoyable. And you can see why when you meet uh, 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 Susan Bodine. Uh, she has been just a joy to be around for a long period of time. She has a longer history with me than, than just, uh, just what I've described. During the Bush administration, she was EPA's assistant administrator over the Superfund program. We we're very busy at that time, you'll remember. Uh, she went above and beyond directing the EPA to not only visit the infamous Tar Creek Superfund site, which I wish we could all forget, uh, in, in, in northeastern Oklahoma, but also worked to clean up the water and the land. She also worked with me to write new legislation that helped the residents there. Uh, Susan, I can't think of, uh, thank you enough for your years of work in the House and in the Senate and at the EPA during the Bush and, and Trump administrations where you made sure EPA was serving, and I underlined that, serving instead of ruling over Oklahoma. Uh, and the Oklahoma taxpayers. Great job, and uh, I look forward to your presentation. Thank you, Senator Inhofe. If witnesses would like to take their, their seats. <clears throat> Thank you. I would like to introduce our next witness, Mr. Josh Shimo. Mr. Shimo is a board member of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, or NACWA. He is also the executive director of the Springfield Water and Sewer Commission, a regional provider of retail and wholesale water and sewer services to the city of Springfield and surrounding communities. The commission serves a population of approximately 250,000 people in the lower Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts. Mr. Shimo is and his leadership team managed more than 225 employees while providing approximately 30 million gallons per day of drinking water and treating 40 million gallons a day of wastewater from the communities they serve. Thank you for being here, Mr. Shimmel. Oh, let me see here. I think I need to go to you. Last but not least, I would like to turn it over to Senator Lummis to introduce our fourth and final witness. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'm really happy to introduce to our subcommittee Mr. Mark Pepper, Executive Director of the Wyoming Association of Rural Water Systems, the largest utility membership in all of Wyoming. In our first subcommittee, uh, our first hearing on the Drinking Water and Wastewater Act last year, I showed a picture of some of the emergency repair work that his association circuit riders were doing during a winter blizzard. So he's not entirely new to this committee. Like me, he grew up in Cheyenne. In fact, I was in high school with his brother. As we often say, uh, Wyoming is just a small town with long streets. Mark has over four decades of finance and administration experience, 33 years in senior management and eight years in public accounting. He's been involved in surface and groundwater issues in Colorado, Nevada, Texas, and Wyoming during his career. 
He served three terms on the board of directors of his local water and sewer utility, chairs the Casper Area Economic Development Joint Powers Board, and has been appointed by the governor to serve on numerous other commissions and task forces. Beyond his incredible wealth of knowledge, Mark is just a good and kind man, and we're lucky to have him testifying here today. Madam Chairman, when I was state treasurer, I served on the State Loan and Investment Board, and we were the board in Wyoming uh, that approved Safe Drinking Water Act SRF monies and uh, um, Clean Water Act SRF monies. So I've seen these funds at work. I've been the one who was on the board that not only um, granted these SRF funds out, but saw them revolve back and work for a variety of communities in our state. And I just think this is a great program. It works so well in, in our small communities in Wyoming. And the great thing is this is a program that works well in large communities like you and Senator Booker have uh, in your states as well. So I'm just delighted that we're having this hearing. Uh, and uh, thank you for, uh, for chairing our, our subcommittee. I yield back. Thank you, Senator Lummis. <clears throat> I would now turn it over to our to the witnesses to present their testimony. Mayor Baraka, you are now recognized for your opening statement. Thank you. <clears throat> Chairwoman Duckworth, Ranking Member Lummis, and members of this esteemed subcommittee, thank you for convening this important hearing on the implementation of Drinking Water and Water Wastewater Infrastructure Act, stakeholders' needs and experiences. I would like to give a special thank you to Senate Committee on Environment and Public Works Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito for their leadership on some of our nation's most important issues. On behalf of the City of Newark, thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony here today. I am here today to, for the 10 million American households that connect to water through lead pipes and service lines and the children, toddlers, and teenagers in 400,000 schools and childcare facilities who are at risk of exposure to lead in their water. Many of whom live in places similar to Newark and whose city's public water pipes were installed in the mid 20th century with an estimated lifespan of 75 to 100 years. While we are rapidly approaching those expiration dates, today we can be thankful to President Biden, Vice President Harris, our Senate and congressional leaders, and to Chairwoman Duckworth who secured her entire bipartisanship Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act in the Bipartisan Infrastructure Deal. This bill is an essential tool in providing safe drinking water to everyone in America and is essential to addressing the financial devastation of COVID-19 that had that laid bare the long-standing and dangerous deficiencies in our utility infrastructure. Chairwoman Duckworth eloquently stated, and I quote, every American has a right to clean water, no matter their zip code, the color of their skin, or the size of their incomes. The difficulty of contaminated drinking water, like many health issues, disproportionately affects black and brown people in cities across America, but is broadly found in suburbs and rural communities similarly. Environmental justice communities, which have historically been overburdened by pollution, will only continue to face increased financial costs, and I wholeheartedly agree with the chairwoman, and I am here today to discuss our experience as a means to support the protection and health of our nation's future. Newark's lead service line project is unprecedented in terms of the scope and speed and has protected the health of, and wellness of the residents of Newark as well as portions of neighboring cities that we service. I'm happy to attest that Newark's lead service line replacement program, one of our city's largest infrastructure projects, has successfully replaced over 23,000 lead lines in less than three years, when experts told us it would take 10 years. This project helped protect the health and wellness of our residents and provided 500 good paying local jobs. Workers on the project worked tirelessly to get this get this accomplished, even through the pandemic, to help safely complete the project. We identified affirmative action goals to establish fair access to employment opportunities and created a program designed to reflect the demographics of our city. In doing so, the program not only was an, of economic benefit to the city of Newark, but also to the state of New Jersey. Our city replaced all the lead service lines at no cost in capital outlay, taxes, or water hikes uh, to our residents or customers in surrounding towns. This was critically important to ensure that everyone in our city had access to clean water. It is my hope that through the implementation of the Drinking Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Act, we can increase grants and state revolving fund loans for communities. There are several components of our project that I would like to share today 
that I hope can assist our communities. As soon as our city realized we had a problem, we acted immediately and initiated a program to distribute over 40,000 National Sanitation Foundation certified water filters and over 110,000 replacement cartridges. We used vast communication models to reach our residents to ensure that those that needed it most were getting the information and had access to vital resources. Our program website is a repository of information for customers to obtain information about the entire program. Education materials were distributed in English, Spanish, and Portuguese by city staff and local community groups. Since lead service lines are the property of the homeowner, the city had to work with our state legislature who created a law that allowed us to use public funds on private property for replacing lead service lines. This was essential to the project's success. In addition, at the local level, Newark's Municipal Council passed an ordinance that gave the city the right of entry to private property to replace all lead lines. This was critical because nearly 80% of Newark residents' rent and tracking down property owners for access to their property would have been time consuming and costly. This lead service line project could not have been possible uh, without the incredible staff of the Department of Water and Sewer under the leadership of Director Kareem Adeem and our entire staff at City Hall. Every level of government came together from our City Council, County Executive Doji Vintenzo, Governor Phil Murphy, federal representatives, and, were with, and they were with us every step of the way and special thanks to Senator Booker, who immediately pushed EPA to commit more federal dollars to help with our response. And more importantly, the true MVPs of this process were our residents, as they were our biggest cheerleaders and support system through this entire project. It is my hope that communities make their residents a part of their replacement projects as we did in Newark, as it only enhances and adds value to the project, as well as the community uh, as a whole. In closing, I hope our story is a good example for our governments that full lead line replacement does not have to be an eternal infrastructure nightmare. With federal funding and imposed deadlines and other governmental cooperation, we have the power to fix it for the health and safety of our current and future generations. For we do know now uh, will be our, what we do now will be our legacy. Thank you again, Chairwoman Duckworth, Ranking Member, member Lummis, and members of this esteemed subcommittee for allowing my testimony today and for your leadership and commitment to our nation's future. Godspeed, forward ever, backwards and ever. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. And now, um, Mr. Shimo, you are recognized for your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Duckworth, Ranking Member Lummis, and the distinguished members of the Subcommittee on Fisheries, Water, and Wildlife. I appreciate the opportunity to address the committee here today. My name is Josh Schimmel. I am the Executive Director of the Springfield Water and Sewer Commission in Springfield, Massachusetts. I also serve as a member of the Executive Board of the National Association of Clean Water Agencies, for whom I appear before you today. For over 50 years, NACWA has represented public wastewater and stormwater agencies nationwide. Our national network of 330 public agency members serves the majority of the sword uh, the, of the nation's sword population and are on the front lines of public health and environmental protection. The need for water and sanitation is as essential as it is timeless. At a recent board meeting, our utility leadership team was contemplating what projects needed to be cut in order to keep, in, uh, keep rate increases affordable. Our elder statesman of the board stopped the conversation and read the following excerpt. An abundant supply of good, wholesome water is the most important requisite of municipal life, and from it flow the most marked advantage, advantage to the community. We are in the habit of taking the water supply as a matter of course, and so long as we have had no experience from the failure of it, we assume that it will continue to flow on forever. He then informed us all that the quote came from the meeting minutes of our own board meeting from 1892. With this anecdote, the Board of Commissioners affirmed that we could not afford to delay investment any longer. They recognized the risk associated with not renewing our infrastructure was actually too costly compared to the actual value provided by replacing it. The historic water infrastructure investments in DWIA and the bipartisan infrastructure law offer much needed respite to local governments working to juggle capital funding needs and ongoing operations and maintenance while keeping customer rates manageable. Clean water utilities are eager to leverage these federal investments as, as bill implementation gets underway. I want to flag a few areas in particular that we strongly supported in the legislation 
and that we are keeping an eye on as areas of opportunity or which may need further congressional attention in the years ahead. An important provision in bill that has gained a lot of attention is how 49% of the dollars flowing out of the traditional SRF programs must be allocated by the states as additional subsidy, meaning rather than low interest loans, they are forgivable loans or straight up grants. Federal water investment since the 1980s has been overwhelmingly loans, so this is an important pivot. Any community would likely prefer a grant to a loan, but this provision will be particularly, particularly important for getting federal help to highly disadvantaged communities that might not have the capacity for loan financing and to target areas facing acute needs uh, or financial hardship. Because the SRFs are run through the states, each of which has its own protocols for how it applies additional subsidy, EPA has outlined recommendations for how states should consider tar targeting the subsidy to reach disadvantaged areas and communities that may not have benefited from SRFs in the past. Strengths of this guidance, including encouraging states to look beyond singular metrics of disadvantage and to consider various metrics like unemployment, how water and sewer rates compare to the lowest quintile income, and ensuring funds reach urban areas of poverty as well as rural and small communities. While EPA has laid out guidance, much will fall to the states to implement. Given the significant influx of funding, we strongly believe that states must be innovative in how they apply additional subsidy, not just do business as usual. We recommend that Congress continue to monitor how additional subsidy is applied to remain open to potentially providing further direction to the programs as implementation advances. DWIA set aside of funding for increased technical assistance will also help ensure that these funds are applied equitably and broadly. Another important provision in bill is the specific allocation of federal funds for the emerging uh, contaminants, including PFAS. Clean water utilities are concerned about the looming costs and regulations that they may face to manage or dispose of contaminants like PFAS, which water utilities passively receive and do not create or profit from. So the funding for utilities specifically to help address new contaminants like PFAS is very welcome. Some of the most immediate costs clean water utilities are seeing to proactively try to understand and limit PFAS in their systems include monitoring, assessments, and pretreatment programs, working with industry to reduce concentrated PFAS discharges into our systems. However, these important steps are not necessarily eligible um, uses of these funds since the SRF is focused on capital investments. Congressional clarity may be needed in the near future to ensure these funds can be put to use effectively. Lastly, as a community that is about to benefit from WIFIA, I want to applaud DWIA's reauthorization of WIFIA and provisions to make the program more accessible to applicants. This past fall, we were awarded a $250 million WIFIA loan for our Springfield Water and Wastewater Infrastructure Renewal Program. Our project will cost $550 million and WIFIA will finance nearly half of that figure. The remaining projects will be funded by a combination of $200 million in loans from the Massachusetts SRF and utility funds. The combination of WIFIA and SRF loans will accelerate capital investment and save the Springfield Water and Sewer Commission approximately $80 million in financing costs which enables the commission to continue to support residents in need through its customer assistance programs. Project construction and operations are expected to create more than 1,700 jobs. We are extremely proud of the way this package has come together to benefit the Springfield region. DWIA and Bill alone will not close the infrastructure investment gap entirely, but, to but take a critical step in the right direction towards helping all communities have access to financial and technical resources to provide clean, Safe water. DWIA set forth stepwise increases in core water program funding, which will applaud uh, the com which we applaud the committee for their urge, their full appropriation moving forward, so that this investment sets a new baseline for strong federal partnership on water. As we knew in 1892 and remains true today, water is the backbone of healthy communities and economic opportunity. In closing, utility executives like myself face environmental, financial, and technical challenges every day. Implementing this historic funding will take a huge lift at all levels of government, and with this five-year funding period, we have the opportunity to make sure we get it right. Thank you for your time, and look forward to any questions. Thank you, Mr. Schimmel. Uh, Ms. Bodine, uh, we'll now turn to you for your opening statement. By the way, Chairman Duckworth has just gone to votes. vote. We've been called vote, so she and I are going to tag team for a while. 
Ms. Bodine, thank you. Thank you. So I want to thank Chairman Duckworth and Ranking Member Loomis and members of the subcommittee for the invitation to speak today. I also want to thank Senator Inhofe for his very kind introduction. It was truly an honor and a privilege to serve this committee uh, as its chief counsel. Uh, so I want to focus my testimony today on some of the challenges that are opportunities, obviously, and challenges that are presented by by the drinking water and uh, wastewater provisions of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. First, let me say that I strongly support all the drinking water and wastewater provisions in that legislation. When I first looked through it, I was like, wow, I recognize every one of these issues. These are issues that have been around for a long time and, and represent enormous challenges for local communities, and this really is you know, an historic opportunity. Uh, but give it the amount of funding that we're talking about here, there are gonna be implementation challenges. That's particularly true because the Clean Water Act and the Safe Drinking Water Act regulations say that states have to attach the funding to a loan, or in this case, a, a assistance agreement within a year after receiving it. So it's gonna be very difficult to meet that deadline. It'll be difficult for states to do that, particularly getting money out to the disadvantaged communities, which of course Congress, which of course all of you made such a huge priority in, the, in this uh, drinking water and wastewater legislation. 49% um, of the funding for the biggest pots of money is set aside for disadvantaged communities. Now appropriations language makes the appropriations available until, um, until expended. So the appropriation money doesn't expire, but what it means is that if a state fails to meet this other, the other deadline of attaching the money, then EPA has the ability to reallocate it. And so what I'm worried about is that the result could be that, that as a result of the deadline, you might get a, you, a reallocation of funding away from states with more disadvantaged communities because of the lack of capacity uh, to, to, to get through the loan process and to, to states that perhaps have more sophisticated uh, communities who know how to get funding from the SRS. So I'm just, I'm just highlighting that. I know that wasn't anybody's intent, but the consequence of the deadlines um, could, have, could, could result in that. And I, and I have to say, some of the small communities are probably gonna have difficulty meeting some of the conditions that are attached to the, the SRF loans. Now, it's not, it's not just lack of sophistication that's gonna cause some of these delays. Uh, I have to say that um, I was concerned when I read the March 8th implementation guidance, and that's because there's a lot of language in there about what EPA expects the states to do, um, and that include revising the state intended use plans, it includes revising, revising state definitions of what's a disadvantaged community. Now when Congress set up the uh, state revolving loan fund programs in the Clean Water Act and the Drinking Water Act, they definitely made them state-run programs, and definitely made them state priorities. I mean, there's language in the Clean Water Act that explicitly says priorities are solely the, you know, the province of the state. Um, and Safe Drinking Water Act was modeled after the Clean Water Act. So when you, uh, so, so this language in the, in the implementation guidance is maybe confusing to states. I mean, there shouldn't be any suggestion that EPA could uh, condition receipt of the funding on meeting its expectations because they, they're not in the law. Uh, I also want to just note that there is a different program in the Safe Drinking Water Act, the Small and Disadvantaged Communities Program, which actually was intended to be EPA run because the pot of money was smaller. And so it was intended to hit the most needy communities uh, and let EPA set, uh, you know, find those communities and allocate the money and direct, direct grants to those. And instead, EPA uh, has implemented that through an allocation formula. So it takes us the money and just spreads it very thin so it doesn't really actually do what it was intended to do. Um, so I just wanna quickly summarize some areas that both EPA might wanna consider changing and EPA might wanna consider changing. First, EPA should avoid any suggestion that they're gonna attach strings to the, to the money that isn't part of the statute. Uh, second, EPA should probably consider whether or not some technology uses are eligible. Yes, uh, it is an infrastructure. I mean, the SRF and the Clean Water and Drinking Water SRF are capitalization, but the, the implementation guidance says that for the lead service line funding, that, um, that monitoring as part of the lead service line project is eligible, 
but it doesn't clearly say that that would include monitoring beforehand. And certainly uh, not compliance monitoring, but specifically monitoring for some of these lead issues has been a challenge. Um, the city of Newark is a tremendous success story, but it did start with a, a lawsuit against the city from NRDC over monitoring and monitoring for lead. So this is a big challenge uh, for cities, and there are technologies available to, to help with that, and it would provide protection before all the lead service lines are going to be replaced. I mean, we, you've, we've heard 10 years, we've heard from Senator Booker. I mean, it'll take a very long time, and in the interim, um, there are things that can be done to protect public health. Uh, and then Congress, again, just to, not to belabor it, but you may want to consider some of the, these deadlines, you know, about when the money would get reallocated away, when it would go away. Um, so again, that's something to look at. Uh, on lead service lines, um, it's going out by an allocation formula. Congress may want to say, when, this, when the inventories are done, there should maybe be a different allocation formula. I mean, right now it's going to everybody, and, and it's eligible for doing the inventory, so that's a good thing. But once the inventories are done, it's going to be clear that some states have a um, bigger problem than others uh, for lead service lines. And finally, if EPA doesn't think that some of these monitoring issues can be addressed uh, under the legislation, uh, then, then Congress might want to think about making some changes also. Um, and so I know I'm way over my time, so I'm going to stop and take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I let you run long because your institutional memory is so valuable to this committee. So thank you. It's great to have you here uh, and have you help us uh, recall what some of the original intents were behind these programs from your experience. Thank you. Um, and now I welcome Mr. Pepper. You are recognized for your opening statement. And then I turn the gavel back to uh, Chairman Duckworth, who has returned from her first vote. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chairwoman Duckworth and Ranking Senator Lummis and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear, appear virtually. I was in D.C. most of last week with small water systems, including the town of Tinsleep, Wyoming, who took home the silver medal at the Great American Water Taste Test. And congratulations, Madam Chair. The Lake Egypt Water District from Illinois was crowned the gold medal winner of the contest. It is an honor to testify today on behalf of small and rural communities like Ten Sleep and Lake Egypt Water District. I'm Mark Pepper, the Executive Director of the Wyoming Association of Rural Water Systems, a nonprofit association of 255 small water systems in the state. I am also testifying on behalf of the National Rural Water Association, which has a membership of over 30,000 small and rural water systems. On behalf of small and rural communities, we appreciate the U.S. Congress for the enactment of the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, or the Infrastructure Bill. This legislation and its approximately $50 billion in water infrastructure funding will be remembered as one of the most significant public drinking water and wastewater initiatives, especially in rural America. Congress included numerous beneficial provisions for rural and disadvantaged communities in the Infrastructure Bill including access to new funding that will help them overcome their challenges and the lack of technical capacity, such as the expansion of technical assistance, subsidized funding, or grants targeted to the communities with greatest need, which are often rural and small. As with any large piece of legislation, it would appear there are a number of who for what art thou language provisions, along with mays and shalls, and the administrator will, will issue rules and guidance that we will all need to work through as we endeavor to assist water systems in utilizing this funding. In Wyoming, much of the water and wastewater infrastructure is 40 to 60 years old and needs replacement and upgrade. This includes drinking water lines, sewer collection systems, water storage tanks, pumps and treatment systems, IT and physical safeguards. Additionally, our current drought is forcing many communities to find new water sources and driving up consumers water bills. In Wyoming, our Department of Environmental Quality administers both drinking water and clean water SRFs. However, the process remains cumbersome for most rural and small communities to complete without the assistance of consulting engineers or technical assistance providers and get on the department's intended use plan. The infrastructure law will infuse three times the traditional amount of state revolving funding in fiscal year 22 in addition to the traditionally appropriated amount included in the fiscal year 22 Omnibus Appropriations Act. 
When contemplating the massive amount of new funding being pumped into the existing system over the next five years, I'm reminded of the line from the movie Jaws, we're gonna need a bigger boat. We also understand the important need to eliminate lead water lines from our utility systems and customer service lines. This will be a daunting task to perform the inventory projects so water systems will have the information necessary to then address potential replacement projects. To that end, our association, as well as many other state rural water associations, have partnered with 120 Water. 120 Water is a company that has developed predictive modeling and database search tools to help all systems in compiling the data needed for the initial inventory. The revised lead copper rule requires this inventory be completed by October 2024. Once the inventory is completed, the systems should have the data necessary to apply for funding. This partnership, along with the availability of increased technical assistance resources, will go a long way to achieving this goal. Many rural and small community local government leaders will need to be educated on the new funding opportunity, as well as the needs of their particular water infrastructure in order to craft a project and submit it for funding. A project development circuit rider could be used to go to council meeting to council meeting in small communities to provide technical assistance for project planning and application. In closing, Madam Chairwoman, small and rural communities, thank you for the opportunity to appear before the subcommittee today, express our strong support of the infrastructure bill, and acknowledge the numerous opportunities this committee has provided rural America to testify and be included in the crafting of federal water and environmental legislation. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Mr. Pepper. Um, and now we'll turn to questions for the witnesses. Uh, Chairman Corper is on his way, and when he gets here, he will um, be recognized for his questions. But until then, I will begin with uh, my first question. Uh, Mayor Baraka, the city of Newark, New Jersey, has recently received national attention due to the success of your city's lead service line replacement program. I, too, want to take the time to highlight Newark's incredible work. In less than three years, under your leadership, the city has replaced all 23,000 lead service lines at no charge to residents. That's truly amazing. With $15 billion provided in the bipartisan infrastructure package in direct payments to the drinking water state revolving fund for lead service line replacement, all states will have access to funds to remove these dangerous lead pipes, but this will also require major planning for the states to implement this effort. Mayor Baraka, as you have already gone through this process, can you elaborate on the city of Newark's lead service line replacement program and speak to the steps the city and mayor's office took to execute this goal? And if you can really talk a bit about the planning process, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, first, uh, we were dealing with three parts of uh, implementation here. One was the uh, use of uh, point of use filters uh, that were distributed to residents. Uh, the other was the replacement of corrosion control to uh, coat pipes in the last, but most important was the replacement of lead service lines. And that was the three-pronged strategy from the very beginning. Even before we got national attention, that was our uh, strategy. Uh, the problem is that that strategy would have took, taken us 10 years or more uh, to get completed. Uh, we immediately used our GIS system that we had in place to identify lead service lines uh, in the city that dated, uh, dated all the way back to 1900. Uh, we used that uh, and compared it also uh, to uh, our uh, consultants' information, homeowners' information uh, that we put together. And we had a project management tool called eBuilder that allowed us to track every lead service line in the city and when they were replaced. Uh, and we allowed it to be forward facing so residents can see when lead service lines were actually being replaced and they could actually type in their own address and see if their lead service line was scheduled to be replaced and when it was scheduled to be replaced, uh, in fact. Uh, when, we, when we had issue, uh, thought we had issue with the filter, we wanted to expedite the program. We got $120 million bond from the county uh, which allowed us to expedite this. So the money up front, the capital outlay is what uh, was the probably the most important piece. And we developed uh, a public works project, the city's largest public works project in, in the history of the city. We involved the residents uh, in the planning of it uh, through meetings, uh, you know, whether it virtual and in-person, virtual, obviously when the pandemic came, 
Uh, we had this in almost every language available uh, to our residents. The, we also established a, a works project so residents can begin to get trained so they can actually change their own lead service lines and put subcontracting uh, opportunities in the language that allow for minority vendors to, to be a part of the replacement of these lines as well. Uh, uh, this, this went on for a, a, a considerable period of time and as uh, COVID happened, it slowed down a little bit, but the, the last thing I wanna say, which I think is important, uh, when we first uh, begun this program, when it was voluntary, only 3% of our residents signed up to get their lead service lines replaced. Uh, they, were, they would have to have paid $1,000 uh, to assist in that when we made it mandatory and free and we passed local law and legislation to allow us to go on people's lines uh, on a people's property we went from replacing 10 to 15 lead service lines a day to 100 lead service lines a day so that was incredibly important for us to do thank you i'm going to suspend my questions and turn uh, and recognize uh, the uh, epw chairman senator carper who has just joined us senator carper I don't, I don't recall the last time a chair and, or chairwoman suspended their questions so I could ask a question, but thank you for your kindness. Uh, I want to uh, welcome to, uh, all of you. Some of you have been uh, with us before, and for others, it's your, your first, uh, first time. I want to thank uh, each of you. I also want to thank uh, our chair and a ranking member on this subcommittee, Chair uh, uh, Senator Alumas, for holding what I believe is, a, is an important hearing, not just for for those of us on this committee, but for the folks that we're privileged to represent back uh, across the country. Um, having a, a full understanding of how the bipartisan infrastructure law, which we help write, uh, literally in this room, uh, uh, how uh, is being implemented and used by communities is, I think, the critical next step in ensuring that these funds uh, are used as, as we intended them to be, to be used. Uh, I have a, a question. I think my first question will be for, for each of you. And Susan, we'll start with you first. Nice to see you uh, again. But uh, uh, my first question are, are the funds uh, that are provided in the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law sufficiently flexible to allow the backlog of, of infrastructure uh, projects to be addressed in, in your state, uh, particularly in small, rural, and disadvantaged populations? And are you facing any implementation challenges? Uh, thank you, Senator sure. Carper. It's great to see you. Uh, so the, um, the concern I have is, you know, we are seeing a uh, historic level of funding which we have not had to manage before. We're also uh, appropriately, uh, Congress decided to um, focus and set aside 49% of the funding for the small and disadvantaged communities. And those the, my concern is that those goals of reaching the money where it's needed the most is going to come up and hit a wall in terms of uh, the obligation to get the money uh, um, attached to uh, an assistance uh, agreement within a year that they receive it from EPA. And I think states, particularly for the small and disadvantaged communities, are going to have a really hard time doing it. It's great that there's technical assistance money in the bill to do that, but uh, it, that is going to be a tremendous challenge, and I would... I, it would be a tragedy if um, if that that deadline meant that the money didn't get to where you intended it to go. Okay. All right, thank you, um, Joshua. Great name from the Bible. Uh, uh, do you pronounce your last name Shemo? Shemo. Oh, very good. Um, and well, would you uh, respond to the same question, please? Sure, I, I would agree in the timing issue, uh, but I would also say the technical assistance. I think is. Uh, extremely important, and the fact that the states have the ability now to utilize uh, design eligibility, so studies and design potentially at the state level would be part of the SRF program. So I think uh, broad interpretation of how those, uh, how entities can utilize the SRF program and technical assistance to get projects off the launching pad, so to speak, so um, design, studies, sampling, those are really critical, uh, critically important to the practitioners uh, who oftentimes, as Susan had said, lack some sophistication in their ability to uh, apply for these types of loans and programs. Thank you, sir. I understand we have a mayor here from the other Newark. In Delaware, we have a Newark. Right. It used to be two words. People say, why do you call it Newark? Well, because it's two words. And uh, <laughs> we have a mayor there, but 
Uh, we're delighted to, to, to hear you. People ask me what I want to do next, next in my life, and I say, I think I'd like to be mayor of Newark, or Newark. <laughs> well, I'm not sure which one. Please go ahead. Same question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think the technical assistance is critical uh, to help people navigate uh, how to uh, not just apply and use this money uh, properly. I think that, that to have them do that uh, up front and during the process is, is critically important. But I think the, the major piece in this is cooperation between state, uh, county, and, and local government. Uh, that's that's key. If we do not have the kind of cooperation, it doesn't matter the technical assistance. You can have the best technical assistance in the world. If there's no cooperation, uh, then these things will be stalled and won't happen. The thing about Newark is we were able to uh, pull all of our partners together from the federal level all the way down to the municipal level uh, to work. And if there's some uh, provisions that even force people to do that, would it would even be uh, even better. Uh, because none of this can happen without the cooperation and collaboration of all levels of government. Thank you, Mayor. And then joining us remotely, I understand, is Mark Pepper from uh, Wyoming Association of Rural Water Systems. We have a Wyoming, Delaware, too. I go there quite a bit. I like to tell uh, our, our colleagues from Wyoming that I was just in Wyoming last weekend. So, uh, <laughs> All right, Mark, take it away. Same question. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, uh, Chairman Carper. Um, yeah, I, I would reiterate the, the issues that we're going to probably have with timelines. I think there are some provisions uh, in talking with our DEQ. They're looking at trying to write some emergency rules uh, to help implement some of this. Uh, so I think, and TA, uh, the technical assistance providers that, that we've been doing all along uh, will be key in helping the, the state uh, meet the needs and, and design those rules so that the uh, money can get out uh, to those systems that really need it the, the quickest. So uh, I'll reiterate what everyone else has said as well. Right, Thank you. So much. Madam Chair, I know my time has expired. I'd like to ask one more question just to one member. That would be Mayor Brock. May I do that? Please do. Oh, good. Thanks, Seth. Um, Mayor Brock, I'm not going to pick on you, but I would like to ask you another question. Um, EPA uh, drinking water and wastewater programs, as you know, allow states to create their own affordability uh, criteria and to, to uh, attempt to target funds to disadvantaged communities uh, throughout their states. Uh, this uh, critical flexibility allows states to meet the unique uh, needs of their vulnerable populations because what works in Delaware may not be what is right for Illinois or Wyoming. My question would be this, would you please share with us how your state's affordability criteria has been used to address Newark's lead pipe replacement program, and are there any lessons you can share from your experience in meeting the needs of underserved communities? I like to say, find out what works, do more of that. <laughs> Thank you. I'm, I'm used to getting picked on. I'm a mayor, so. <laughs> but. But uh, the great thing about our program it, that, that it was free to all of our residents. Uh, it was no cost to anyone, so no one had to pay to get their lead service line replaced, uh, not in capital costs, not in taxes, not in uh, fee, uh, you know, raising the fees. None, none of that had, took place, so everybody equitably got their uh, lead service lines replaced. Uh, and that was made possible because we changed the law on a state level that allowed us to use private dollars to replace uh, public lines. And because we had the upfront cash capital outlay from the bond created by uh, the county government uh, on, on our behalf. Uh, we also, during the pandemic, uh, created a moratorium on uh, folks uh, turning people's uh, water off in the middle of that. Uh, and uh, we uh, gave people what we call opportunities of deferred payment to pay over a time period uh, their water bills during this time uh, as well. Uh, and we were very flexible around that, uh, and we continue to be uh, as we move through, uh, through this pandemic. All right. Thank you, sir. Um, I have other questions. I, I will uh, you, uh, submit those for the records if it's all right with the chairman, unless you insist that I ask another one now. I, but only if you insist. You're welcome to ask another now if you would like to. Are you insisting? I'm insisting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Because she insists, I, I, my third question, uh, I don't mean to appear greedy in asking questions, but Ms. Bodine, uh, Susan, um, and Mr. Pe Pe Mr. Pepper, uh, this is uh, regarding technical assistance funding. Mm -hmm. Something's been mentioned by several of you already. Um, Ms. Bodine, Mr. Pepper. The EPA's uh, implementation memo to states recommends, as you know, that the state revolving funds 
use the full tactical assistance set-aside allocation. These uh, 2 percent carve-outs from the annual um, SRF funding provide capacity building assistance that can be used to help small, rural, tribal, and disadvantaged uh, communities to identify needs, develop projects, and apply for funding. Here's my question. Uh, would you please share with us how technical assistance has been a beneficial tool for the communities with which you have worked, and are there additional ways that we could help small, rural, tribal, and disadvantaged communities gain access for EPA programs? Ms. Bodine, would you like to go first? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, uh, I think that the um, provisions in the bipartisan infrastructure bill on the, on the technical assistance are tremendously important. And I do think, uh, and I would ask Mr. Pepper to, to get the on the ground view of this, but I do believe you have provided enough flexibility in that, in that technical assistance to allow the, the, the pots of money going to where it needs to go, whether it's circuit riders, whether it's the states um, and the, you know, who can contract with circuit riders or, and then EPA providing help as well. And to, your, to part of your question about how does it help, I mean, you do have, there are situations where uh, people, you know, small systems don't have they literally don't even have operators, much less the sophistication about how to um, how to gain access to funding. And so, you know, the circuit rider program, technical assistance on the ground has always just been tremendously important to protection of public health. All right, thank you. And uh, before I, I uh, uh, over, overstay my welcome, let me ask uh, Mr. Pepper to respond to the same question remotely. Thank you, Madam Chair, Chairman Carper. Uh, you know, the technical assistance, the circuit rider program has been a cornerstone of the National Rural Water Association and all of the 50 uh, state affiliates. Uh, all of our uh, circuit riders are, are versed in, in application process or versed in project management, project development. And uh, you know, as, as uh, Senator Lummis said, 97% of the systems in Wyoming serve under 10,000. Well, 92% of those serve under 500. So being able to have more technical assistance providers like that, and I, I typically have about four or five, a list of four or five additional uh, certified operators who'd like to come to work for us uh, that can then go out and meet with those small systems uh, and, and just give them a, a helping hand in developing those projects and developing the application process and, and working with their engineers. Uh, it's just a, a, a lifeline that, that uh, it has been a cornerstone and, and I'm glad to see that it was expanded. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, Madam Chair, thank you very much for uh, holding this hearing to you and Senator uh, Alumas and for our witnesses uh, for, for being here. Uh, mayor, uh, mayor of uh, Newark, I uh, ask me to extend a uh, warm welcome to Newark sometime when you're on your way south on uh, 95 and you're thinking, where should I stop for a, a, a break? Uh, come come and see uh, your sister uh, town, okay? Thank you. Yeah, great to see you guys. Definitely. All right, thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you, Chairman Carper. And now joining us by WebEx, Senator Whitehouse is recognized. Senator Kelly, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and since this is our first subcommittee hearing since the infrastructure bill was signed into law, let me uh, just quickly say, you know, thank you to Senator Duckworth and Lummis for all, all of your work alongside Chairman Carper and Ranking Member Capito to get the drinking and wastewater infrastructure bill across the finish line. Thank you for that. It's uh, really a big deal in, in the state of Arizona. Uh, Mr. Schimmel, I want to start with a question for you. Um, in your testimony, you discussed the $10 billion, which was included in the infrastructure law to address PFAS contamination. Uh, this is a big challenge for the state of Arizona. Both the Phoenix and Tucson areas have growing PFAS plumes in our groundwater aquifers. Mm -hmm. And as we face worsening drought conditions along the Colorado River, groundwater will become a more important source of drinking water for many communities. 
Yet, like you discussed in your testimony, I've heard uncertainty from water and wastewater utilities in Arizona about whether investments in monitoring or assessment of our aquifers is an eligible expense within the Clean Water SRF program. So, Mr. Schimmel, can you expand upon your testimony to explain the types of investments that utilities like yours would like to make to address PFAS contamination, including expenses which may not be eligible for clean water SRF funding in the infrastructure law? <clears throat> sure, thank you. Uh, for Um, I think that the, the importance of flexibility with all of this funding, whether it's technical assistance or through the design component of SRFs, is going to be critical in how communities um, put, put the structure to how they will address PFAS. Certainly, as the regulations um, roll out state by state, the sampling component of that will be adopted by water and wastewater utilities. I think um, there's a lot of issues with PFAS, not just in drinking water, but on the wastewater and sludge disposal as well. And so there's a lot of opportunity um, for innovation uh, in all of this. Uh, I do think that specifically there needs to be uh, flexibility with the funding in terms of technical assistance and especially that design component for planning studies as well. And that would be the concerns that I have uh, in terms of PFAS and how it can be addressed as it continues to um, kind of storm uh, across the U.S. And, and is of great concern. Uh, can you give some examples of those opportunities in innovation? Sure. I think there, there's treatment innovations on the drinking water side. Uh, Large-scale treatment is we really haven't seen it up in the, in the Northeast uh, for surface waters where we have more surface water. I think uh, there's going to have to be development of the ability for PFAS treatment on a larger scale than we've seen for large municipalities. And uh, on the wastewater side, in sludge disposal, incineration, gasification, uh, those issues, there's a lot of room for, in, uh, a lot of room for innovation on, on how we treat, um, to, how to treat PFAS or remove PFAS from the water stream or the air stream. Uh, but those are going to be extremely expensive, and I, I would urge that uh, as much focus as we have as PFAS, and it's certainly uh, a very important and prominent, we also can't forget our meat and potatoes infrastructure as well, and there needs to be a balance amongst what we're looking at. So again, I think there's a great deal of opportunity. Regulations have to allow us to seek out that opportunity and innovate on how we treat um, PFAS and how we remove it, um, and, and that's the answer. Well, on the, on the PFAS side, what do you think we can do here in Congress, or what do, what do you need from the EPA to make the most of the, of the funding uh, that we've appropriated? And I mean, like, is there, is there additional legislation that you can think might be helpful? You know, I, I think um, to some degree addressing PFAS as, as water That's providers true. and wastewater providers, it doesn't start with us. We receive it. It's not our PFAS. And I think to the extent that we can start to remove PFAS from uh, the train that we receive, it will be more helpful. It's much more uh, practical to remove the source of the PFAS than gather it at a water system and try to remove it uh, at that level. That's a very expensive proposition. Thank you, and thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Thank you. Um, and now, uh, via WebEx, Senator Whitehouse. Thanks very much, and um, nice to see you chairing the hearing, Senator. Um, Mayor Baraka, have I pronounced your name correctly? Yes. Yes, thank you, Senator. Yes. Great, thank you. Um, Fighting lead contamination goes takes me back a long way to when I was attorney general and brought the first lawsuit against the lead paint industry for the public nuisance of what they were doing in Rhode Island and for the harms to children. So I'm really interested in trying to figure out how you made this work sounds like you replaced over 23,000 lead lines in less than three years. What did that structure of that look like? How did you, 
How did you make that happen? Did you have a special entity set up for it? How did you finance it? How did you manage it? What were the metrics? So we, uh, thank you for that, Senator. We uh, had, again, a GIS system that allowed us to access records as old as 1900 to begin to identify lead service lines in the city. We compared that yeah. uh, with our uh, CDM Smith, our consultant, who was also identifying yeah. lead service lines and community-based organizations and homeowners to identify where the lead service lines were. That 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 was uh, number one. We were able to get a a bond from use a bond from the county government of 120 million dollars that added on to the money that we were getting uh, from the state and federal sources, uh, which created about a hundred and seventy million dollar project uh, in the city. Uh, we we then had to change the law, state law, to allow us to spend that money on public sources, and we did that. Uh, on, on private, excuse me, private property, and we did that. And then locally, we changed the law to allow us to go on people's property uh, without the permission of the homeowner. Was that through your public works issue. department? Was that through your water department? Was that through a new entity? How did you manage it? We managed it through our water department and a project management yeah. system that we have called eBuilder that helped us track uh, the progress of every lead service line and when it was replaced. You could actually type your address into that and it would tell you when we were coming to replace your lead service line. Well, I think that's really impressive. And has it been, has your success been studied or written up anywhere in any kind of a journal or academic paper? I mean, uh, there, there are countless uh, articles in newspapers now, and I know that their CDM Smith did, the consultant uh, wrote something, but there, there's nothing uh, at this point that I would say in, you know, the kind of national journal or uh, academic uh, journal. No. Yeah. Well, thank you for what you've done. You've uh, expanded the window of possibility, I think, by getting 23,000 lead lines done in three years. So we'll, we'll do our best to uh, be as successful in Rhode Island. Thanks very much. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Whitehouse. I'm going to resume my questions. One of the biggest motivators for me to draft DEWIA was to increase access to funding for communities who need it the most, but often cannot ac access it. And this has led to systematic inequity. In my state of Illinois, the community of Cahokia Heights has been experiencing horrifying sewer overflow issues for years mm. and is in urgent need of repairs, including replacing sewer pipes, pumps, and lift stations, and drainage systems. But communities like this likely will never qualify for traditional loans or be able to provide a large cost share, and there are almost no other options for them. How are struggling communities ever expected to prosper economically if they do not have functioning drinking water and wastewater infrastructure? You can't build a tax base if people don't want to move into your community. The WIA attempts to address these issues by creating a set-aside in the sewer and stormwater reuse grant program and increases the percent of both the drinking water and clean water SRFs that must go to disadvantaged communities for grants, no interest loans, and debt forgiveness. We've discussed some of them today already. Not to mention over 40% of bills funding can be allocated to small disadvantaged rural and tribal communities. Mr. Shimo, you have experience in working with all different types of water providers and community projects and communities in your role as executive director of the Springfield Water and Sewer Commissions and board member of NACWA. Can you explain what would you say are the biggest impediments to disadvantaged water systems getting funding? And are there any changes in DEWIA that you think will help with some of these issues? Sure, thank you, Senator. Um, I mean, I, I think one of the largest challenges is the overall lack of experience of small and disadvantaged communities of having uh, utility providers that have utilized these programs, and I think that is a barrier. Um, and I think the second largest challenge is really creating a rate structure that's affordable to those communities that supports the capital investment. And, you know, we're, we're looking at 50 years plus or minus of underinvestment in all of our water and wastewater systems. And so that challenge, uh, that, that's a really big challenge because we do need to raise rates 
in order to do the work. We need to raise the money. So I think the, the three things that are really going to help are the grants program. Um, that's going to give access to communities that can't raise the money on their uh, own or when they they're not willing to raise rates. So I think that's uh, extremely important. Um, the technical assistance, again, um, that's going to help inexperienced borrowers get through the process, identify projects, um, and then utilize that help to um, put applications in to utilize the funding. And then the design eligibility, I think a lot of projects stop because there's no funding for design. So you can pick your project, you can build your project, but you can't get it off the launching pad if you can't design it. So that eligibility uh, for design and studies uh, as part of the SRF, SRF programs at the state level, I think is critically important. So those three things, the grants, the technical assistance, and uh, the design eligibility in the SRF programs will really help um, lower the bar in terms of making it more accessible to those communities. Thank you. Mayor Baraka, I understand that almost 80% of Newark's residents are renters. You, you mentioned it in your opening statement. And it can often be very difficult to reach landlords and property owners in order to access their property to proceed with the lead service line removal. Additionally, there can sometimes be legal road roadblocks when attempting to use public funds on private property. Um, as I imagine, numerous states, including my state of Illinois, will have this issue, especially in urban areas and low-income communities. Can you explain in greater detail, you touched on this a couple times about passing legislation, making it free. If, if you could expand on it a little bit more on how the city of um, Newark was able to overcome these problems, it would, I think, be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, Senator. I, uh, as I spoke earlier about the, ne the need for cooperation uh, between all entities of government, uh, we had to uh, communicate with our state legislatures to get them to understand the severity of the issue and the urgency of the problem. Uh, they helped us change the, lo the law uh, that would allow us to use public money on private property. They changed the law in the middle of it, uh, which gave us the permission when we got the bond to use that bond to, in fact, change people's lead service lines. That's that's number one. Number two, as you stated, many of our landlords uh, are not local. Uh, and when we were first doing it before we got the bond, uh, less than 3% of folks signed up. So we had to go door to door, knock on door to door and get people's permission to come and change their lead service line. Even with the help of multiple community organizations, uh, we were getting traction, but not enough. Uh, it would have taken us a longer, longer time to be able to get that done. So we passed a local ordinance uh, using a public health emergency, suggesting that uh, we should be able to come on your property and change your lead service line without the permission of the homeowner. Uh, and that expedited this uh, tremendously uh, we went from changing 10 lead service lines to a day to 100 uh, lead service lines a day. Uh, so those two laws were very critical in helping us uh, get this done. Thank you. Um, I now would like to um, turn over both the gavel while I go vote on the second vote and also recognize the ranking member for her questions. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, my first question is for uh, Ms. Bodine and Mr. Pepper, what what is the Brooks Act, yeah. and and how could it impact small or disadvantaged communities from using these federal funds? Thank you, Senator, for that question. So the Brooks Act is federal legislation that says if federal dollars are being used for a project, then um, for the the design elements, it has to be a, a separate a separately uh, competed project and that the community has to pick from the top three most um, expert com uh, companies. So, so it's, you know, the, the uh, you could say it's well-intentioned, so you don't go with low-cost bidders on design. You could say, if you wanted to criticize it, you could say it's an example of a of a, an association essentially getting into federal law to give them a competitive advantage for federal dollars. But whatever your view is, the reality on the ground is that it does create a tremendous barrier for small communities because you don't have, you know, these small projects, you don't even have the big national architecture, you know, engineering design firms even bidding on them. Yeah. I mean, it just, it doesn't make sense for small projects. I used to get lobbied on this when I worked in the house 
and we always, you know, we always raised the small community concern. Um, it did, um, it did get into the Clean Water Act in, in 2014 in the Word of Bill. And in my recommendations, I do recommend that Congress amend that to add a cost threshold. You know, okay, because, I mean, these big engineering firms, they don't even want to, they're not going to bid on these small projects. It, it, it's not even an issue. But nonetheless, uh, the, uh, the legislation applies to them. Mr. Pepper, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Senator. Um, yeah, you know, in Wyoming, um, the small communities typically have a consulting engineering firm that they've contracted with that acts in de facto as their engineering department. Uh, the engineers then uh, work with public works, put a, put a project together, and then uh, it goes out to bid to the contractors who will be performing the actual work. Uh, and I think that, that um, this particular provision has, has created an underutilization of the SRF in Wyoming uh, for that reason. Uh, USDA and, of course, state money, SLIB and, and so forth, don't have that, that provision. Uh, and it allows the, the communities to utilize that consulting engineer that they've had on staff relatively uh, for a number of years and understands their systems. So I see it as a, a potential um, impediment. Well, thank you. I, uh, interestingly, in Wyoming, there are only 12 towns whose population exceeds their elevation. So think about that one. Chew on that for a minute. Ms. Bodine, um, what are some of the examples of creeping conditions in the March 8th guidance that, that cause concerns, that jump out at you? Certainly. Uh, thank you for that question. Well, the, um, yeah, it is true that when these SRF programs were originally set up, you know, they, it was a shift from grant programs to state-run programs, and it was initially you know, very... Um, yeah, very much state run and only the initial federal capitalization grants were considered federal dollars. Now over time, Congress, and this is, you know, Congress has changed the law to apply things like, uh, like Davis-Bacon and of course uh, American Iron and Steel. Uh, the uh, infrastructure bill also adds the Buy America, Build America, which we don't have guidance on yet, so it's, gonna, it's unclear how that's gonna apply. But Troublingly, uh, EPA's implementation guidance adds to that. So, you know, it's one thing that Congress put it in, but when EPA is saying things like states should uh, tell, tell uh, their communities that they should enter into project labor agreements, for example, there's nothing in the statute about project labor agreements at all. Yes, Davis-Bacon applies, but not to project labor agreements, which says union, and, and you have right to work states. Yeah. Uh, so it, that makes it, it, it's not EPA's authority or role to do that. They also, I ha, you know, I know that we've heard testimony on both sides on the disadvantaged community definitions and the intended use plans. But again, that it, it's a state uh, a state decision. I was really happy to see to hear T Senator Carper say yes. It's very different in Delaware and Wyoming about what's a disadvantaged community, and so this really truly had to be state decisions. And so my biggest concern was, you know, the, the EPA didn't say shall didn't say they must, but says they expect it and that they should do it, and I'm just worried that states will view that as a mandate. Yeah, well, if it's on a checklist and there's a blank uh, on the checklist, that may trigger um, EPA to um, deny some sort of funding. So, yeah, big concern. Thank you. Um, this is for all panelists. What should Congress be doing going forward to make sure these federal dollars make the most impact in the communities that you work or represent? Mayor, would you, would you take, care to take a stab at that one? Sure. I think that some of the things, thank you, Senator, I think some of the things that are happening uh, are exactly what needs to happen. The infrastructure bill is important uh, to put resources in the hands of as many people as possible. And if, if it get directly to the cities, you know, I, I would advocate that that money come directly to the cities. I think cities and mayors can use it uh, uh, very quickly. Uh, we can expedite it and you can see the impact that we have uh, immediately uh, if that in fact takes place. 
uh, you know, uh, and to make sure that some of this, this money is actually flexible, that folks can use it in the way that they think is necessary uh, as it relates to the infrastructure in their community, uh, particularly around lead service lines, and it gives, it gives us the opportunity to use local laws and state laws as well uh, to do this as quickly as we possibly can. Mr. Schimmel, any comments on this? Great. Uh, I, I Thank you, Senator. I agree uh, with the mayor. Continued funding is the single most important yeah. uh, uh, issue for all of us. Um, I would also add that making sure that there's eligibility for independent um, utilities such as ours that are regional versus municipal. Um, at, at points, we have not been eligible for certain funding that has come out because we're a regional entity and don't have a municipal governance. Uh, and then it, continuing to incentivize the state SRF programs to innovate um, in order to, to gain new membership into the folks who are utilizing the SRF programs. Not enough folks uh, utilize it, and if there's any way that they can incentivize to lower the bar or make it easier for communities um, to, to get their hands on the funding, I think that would be uh, exceptionally important. Thank you. Ms. Bodine? Yes, thank you. Um, I, so this is an historic influx of funding. And so, and, and yes, it's mostly being channeled through the state revolving loan funds, which are set up as uh, for capital investment. Now, we've heard some of the folk, people here today talk about um, ability for planning. Uh, you know, it, yes, it can be used, used for lead service line inventory. But I guess one, one suggestion I would make is that, uh, that you may want to expand the eligibilities to include some some innovative monitoring to uh, to identify problems, whether it's the PFAS, whether it's the lead, uh, so that you are providing public health protection right now. Because it, as as Senator Booker said when he spoke, it's going to take ten years or more, for example, to get rid of all the lead service lines, yeah. and you have people who are exposed in the interim, or or we don't know if they're exposed or not. And so taking some small amount of that money, and I'm not, you know, obviously these are hugely expensive programs. You need the capital investment. But taking some money for some interim health, public health protection m might, might be a good idea. Okay. Thank you. And Mr. Pepper? Thank you, Senator. Um, uh, continued funding, maximum flexibility uh, with the end uh, result in mind. Uh, getting from point A to point B, which is upgrading our infrastructure, uh, getting rid of lead lines, uh, addressing PFAS, uh, but allowing maximum flexibility on how we go from point A to point B, uh, I think is probably the, the determinant that we're gonna have to have going forward. Thank you. Um, I have the luxury of uh, the fact that the chairman wants to come back from her vote, and so I get to extend the, the time a little bit, and we'll take advantage of it. Yeah. Uh, so this also is for all the panelists. In, in the March 8th guidance, Justice 40 is referenced multiple times throughout the document, but the EPA does not define explicitly to state SRF programs what exactly it is. Justice 40 is the president's plan to have 40% of the benefits from federal investments in climate go to disadvantaged communities. We've heard concerns that Justice 40 is going to lead to a standard one-size-fits-all definition of disadvantaged communities. So to all the panelists, is a disadvantaged community in one state necessarily the same in another? Mayor, would you like to take that one on? Sure, absolutely. First, I, I, I think that it is the right thing to do to identify uh, disadvantaged communities who have not had the ability to respond uh, to environmental issues and, and other issues that are no fault of their own, except that they're, they're zip code. Um, you know, so generally, there are things that are similar throughout the country, no matter where you live. Uh, you know, people are discriminated against for very specific reasons uh, and are, are victims of environmental disaster for very specific reasons because they don't have enough money. Uh, you know, they're disproportionately black and brown. Uh, they may be immigrants uh, and they move into these communities and these things exist there. Their legacy 
uh, kind of environmental issues that exist in these communities and should be addressed in those communities uh, because they've been there forever. Uh, whether they're next to the water in the port or the airport, uh, you know, all of those things because they're in big cities and, and, and rural areas, all of those things need to be addressed. Then there are some specific things that may be particular to other people's communities uh, that are different uh, in other, you know, states and cities. There are some disadvantages that people have, particularly uh, based on the region that they live in. So that while those things should be considered, I think is uh, equally important to understand that there's a general sense of what this being disadvantaged is, uh, and we cannot uh, have uh, one or the other. We should be dealing with and. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mr. Schimmel, any thoughts to add on that one? One size does not fit all. Mm -hmm. um, absolutely, we have urban areas, uh, Springfield in particular, disadvantaged community, but I would also look to some of uh, the rural areas uh, in Western Massachusetts where it, it's a two-person shop and they do everything and they don't have the time to fill out the, the loan paperwork and have never done anything even close to that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I think uh, as long as there's not a one-size-fits-all, I think there's a lot of different types of disadvantage and I think that um, the, the funding needs to be able to reach into those corners um, where it's obvious, but also there's some areas where it's not so obvious, where there's other types of disadvantage. So uh, I think it's important that there's flexibility in all of this and it's not uh, scripted as a one size fits all. Thank you. Ms. Bodine, your state and mine have Indian reservations, which would particularly uh, come to the fore when you're thinking about disadvantage in some cases. Certainly that's true in Wyoming on the Wind River Indian Reservation. Uh, but uh, would you respond to Certainly. this question? Um, and yes, the tribal areas present their own very unique challenges with respect to wastewater and drinking water. And I speak that as the former head of EPA enforcement. <laughs> it's like, oh no. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, leaving, um, so to that, to your specific question, um, uh, yes, there was an executive order with a goal of 40% of the funding going to disadvantaged communities. Uh, Congress, though, has said, you, you have said already, 49, 49%, not 40%, is to go to disadvantaged communities from mm -hmm. these, these various pots of money. Mm -hmm. So the issue is, it's addressed, it's taken care of. There's nothing further, I don't believe, for EPA to do. And so my concern is that there would be an attempt to overlay a, a federal definition of disadvantaged community uh, on top of what this, what's in the, in the statutes, because the definition both in the infrastructure bill and in the underlying Clean Water Act and in the Safe Drinking Water Act is about eligibility for a, what's called in the statute additional subsidization. So it's for what are the communities that need this money? They, they need the extra subsidy. Uh, uh, they aren't eligible, they don't have an, they're not eligible for the loans because they'll never be able to pay them back and therefore yeah. the SRFs won't give it to them. Yeah, yeah. And so it's that, it's those definitions about, about uh, where does the money gonna go, where it's needed, where, where are the needs the most, which is, a, which, is, um, which, is fair, which is specific, whereas the broader definition of, of the disadvantaged community, uh, it could be much broader, but it may not bring into account some of, that, uh, some of the financial affordability issues. Um, so again, you took care of it in the, in the infrastructure bill with the 49% set aside. The underlying statute took care of it, by uh, setting up the definitions and, and the responsibilities for states to set their disadvantaged community criteria. So I don't think there's anything further to be done here to meet, and the goal will be met. Thank you. And Mr. Pepper. Agreed. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, reservations do pose a, a great opportunity uh, in Wyoming, as, as you know. Uh, Wind River has two tribes. Uh, we work very closely with both tribes. In fact, the president of our association is the utility manager for the Eastern Shoshone mm -hmm. uh, utility. Um, yeah, I think it should be left to the states for the definition, uh, I guess, uh, taking a, uh, a wording from, from a prior career of mine, you say potato, I say potato. Uh, I think the definitional aspects should be left to the states. Well, thank you all very much. I will return the gavel to our uh, committee chairwoman, uh, Senator Duckworth. Thank you, Senator Lemus. I just have uh, one final question. Um, it goes back to Mayor Baraka. Uh, I'm a big promote, proponent of promoting local hiring 
uh, initiatives when awarding contracts, and I think it should be a priority for all states, including my own state of Illinois, um, although there have been challenges. Uh, your city of Newark was able to turn this program into a local hiring initiative, creating somewhere around 600 jobs, where at least 250 were local hires, and 85% were previously unemployed residents, which is quite remarkable. Uh, this is admirable, and it is such an important part of executing these programs. Uh, it allows this water infrastructure initiative to not only help the health and safety of the community, but also using this opportunity to benefit local workforce and the economy. Um, Mayor Baraka, was this local workforce hiring an intentional part of the implementation of Newark's LED program? And did you see this inclusion of local hires have a positive effect on your city? It was uh, deliberate and, and very intentional. Uh, not only did we write it in the actual contracts, we set up training programs for residents so that they would be prepared to receive these jobs. Uh, so we wrote in a contract they had to hire local residents and the number of uh, percentage of local residents they had to try to hire, and they did that. We also uh, put in the contract that some of the subcontractors also had to be local, uh, and we created a small uh, kind of low-interest loan, uh, you know, a forgivable loan to small businesses so they can be able to uh, pay money up front to be able to get the resources that they needed to actually compete uh, for these jobs, uh, for these contracts, and they did that. And as a result of that, uh, many Newark residents were hired, as well as Newark businesses began to subcontract uh, on these projects and are now primaries on other projects that are happening across the state in replacing lead service lines. That's um, a wonderful example. Thank you. Um, before we, we close the hearing, I'd like to recognize Senator Lummis for any final questions or comments. Well, thank you, Madam Chairman. And I'm going to borrow uh, from our, our committee chair. Uh, he has this wonderful tradition of wrapping up hearings by asking our fine witnesses, what question do you wish you would have been asked that you haven't been asked? So if anyone cares uh, to put in a, a closing word, now would be the time. Good, I, you know, I. This is such a significant program. I'm I'm so um, impressed with the way it operates and how flexible and responsive it has been. I hope it can continue to be that way because our communities are so different, and these funds just seem to get to the right places and solve real problems. Uh, and and so I really want to thank you, Madam Chairman, for having this hearing, and thank you, witnesses, very, very much for uh, providing me. your expertise and good advice to this committee. Uh, Madam Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. I think Mr. Pepper had a um, comment oh, good. Oh, from good. WebEx. Yes, I, I thank you, Senator. I, I've always been uh, shy. Um, <laughs> I guess I'd, I'd, I'd just like to respond to a question on, on PFAS and, and emerging contaminants that Senator Kelly brought up. We have uh, the source water protection planning program within our associations. We deal with watershed uh, planning uh, protection plans as well. And I think there is uh, funding that, that flows through the USDA FSA uh, for source water protection. There's also uh, the NRCS has funding uh, and a requirement for source water protection. And I think as it relates to groundwater sources, uh, both in Wyoming and in Arizona and Senator Kelly, I'm a NAU graduate up the road in Flagstaff. Um, we're, uh, we're ready and, and have been doing some of that all along. And as it relates to the emerging contaminants, uh, that's a, a portion of the source water protection program is, is looking at potential contaminants and mitigation efforts regarding that. Uh, so I think uh, the funding that's available within uh, the infrastructure bill for uh, emerging contaminants can probably be expanded and, and combined hopefully with some of the FSA and NRCS money that NRCS money uh, 
uh, and can help to address uh, the PFAS issues uh, quicker and um, with more breadth. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Bodine. Yes, and may I just follow up on what Mr. Pepper just said? Uh, so when, the, when um, Senator Kelly was talking about emerging contaminants and PFAS, I went to the implementation guide to see the eligibilities just to refresh my recollection. And you know, the money is going through the SRFs, so it is uh, capital in, in investment uh, for the new, you know, new treatment technology, new treatment facilities, identifying new sources, consolidating. It does include planning and design. But um, to the point I've, I've made with respect to the lead, it, it doesn't include identifying the problem. So it's capital investment after you've already identified the problem, but it doesn't include the um, you know, finding, you know, doing the maybe the more sophisticated innovative technology to find the problems. Um, and so that's just a consideration. Clearly the real cost, the big cost, is on the infrastructure investment. And then that's what the money is dedicated to because that's how the SRFs, that's they're intended for. But again, when we're dealing with some of these newer issues, uh, like the emerging contaminants, or frankly, the old issues where we've got people being exposed to lead in drinking water for, for years and years and years and years, we may want to consider some expanded eligibilities. Again, not for the bulk of it, but just for some of it. Thank you. In the Army, we used to say, any alibis? <laughs> OK. Um, as there are no more questions, uh, we will, did you want to say? OK. All right. As there are no more questions, we will bring this hearing to an end. But before we adjourn, some housekeeping. Um, I don't know if we received any submissions while I was gone, but I would like to ask unanimous consent to submit for the record a variety of materials that relate to today's hearing. All right, without objection. Uh, Senators will be allowed to submit questions for the record through the close of business Tuesday, April 19th. We will compile those questions, send them to our witnesses, and ask our witnesses to reply by Tuesday, May the 3rd. And I want to thank with the witnesses and senators for participating in this important hearing. And with that, the hearing is adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>